Hey everyone, good morning, happy Monday. We are broadcasting live from our Marriage Helpers studio here in Nashville, Tennessee, where last week it was snowing and this week it is raining. So we never know what the weather is gonna be, but we're excited to be here with you. I'm joined by our host, Dr. Joe Beam. Good afternoon. I think you said yeah, morning, I but I believe I in some parts of America it's still morning, in some parts this afternoon. True. Good afternoon. It's true. We have an exciting program today that we're excited to jump into in just a bit. We're going to be talking about topics such as attraction. How can you attract your spouse back to you? We're going to be teaching you exactly how we teach that here at Marriage Helper. It's one of our foundational principles. And something else we're going to be talking about is children how children can affect a marriage, but even more than that, what about when you're married and don't have children and then you're wondering whether or not you should fix things? If you don't have that to bring you together, should you? We're gonna be talking about that. We're also gonna be taking your questions live. So if you're watching live right now on YouTube, you can chat in your questions. We're gonna be monitoring those. We're gonna be answering the ones that we can. We love that live interaction. And so we look forward to hearing your questions, being able to answer them for you in real time. And we have some other things that we're gonna be doing throughout the program as well. We have a new giveaway that we're gonna do in one of our segments a little bit later. So you can just stay in the loop on that, wait for that to happen. It's gonna be awesome. We're gonna read a testimony of someone who has saved their marriage and it's absolutely awesome. But we'll get to that in just a few minutes. So, Joe. Yes. We're going to talk about what we talk about here at Marriage Helper called the love path. So mm -hmm. one of the things we believe that you've taught to thousands and thousands of people across the world is that there's actually a process to falling in love. That's correct. Can you tell us a little bit more about that before I get into the question? Well, I can give only the, the very brief answer for that because it would take too much time to do it otherwise. Actually, I do call it the love path. And it, it goes through four phases that people go through when they develop a relationship. Uh, at least three of those make a relationship last. The fourth stage, if people get to it, they actually reach levels of intimacy. And by that, I mean openness and transparency and vulnerability and just closeness that most other couples don't know about. It would take the whole program and more to explain the entire love path to you. But basically, it goes like this. The first thing that draws you to another person is that you are attracted to him or her. And there's tons of research out there about what attracts one person to another that I'll leave up to Kimberly in a few minutes to, to lead us into. And then once you find yourself attracted to a person, if you decide to develop a relationship, there's a next phase that's called acceptance. And that's when you learn how to accept each other as you are, which leads to another phase called attachment. And that's when you commit to each other. And if you do indeed commit to each other, it doesn't mean everything's going to be good from that point on <laughs> because there'll still be difficulties. There'll still be trials and troubles. That's just part of life. And then the last phase that most people never get to, but the ones that do find it phenomenal is the stage called aspiration. Now, unfortunately, I can't explain all those in detail in just a couple of minutes there, but it is a thing called the love path. We've showed it, we have shown it, I should say, to uh, thousands and thousands of people, including marriage counselors, therapists, other kinds of counselors, and to psychiatrists even, who have looked at it and said, yeah, that's pretty well it. That's the way it works. Now, it may vary a little with an individual, you understand, but it's generally the process that people go through when they fall in love. So I say this about it. You follow that process, you fall in love whether you intend to or not. If you vacate that process or violate that process, you fall out of love, whether you intend to or not. But the first part of it is attraction. I think that's what we're supposed to talk about with some questions that were sent in. We do. We have some questions that are about attraction, but we're going to need to do a little bit of teaching on what four parts of attraction are before <laughs> okay. I can get into what the question is. Okay. I noticed you picked up that book. Was there I a did. reason for that? I was going to show people. So this is, if you're wanting to know more about that love path that Joe was talking about, this is one of the books that he's written. And in this one, The Art of Falling in Love, which you can get on Amazon, you can get it from us, but we can't give the two free day shipping, <laughs> the two day free shipping. Um, but this book, he goes through that love path. He talks about why we fall in love, what those four stages of love are and how you can fall into it. So I wanted to show people. Yeah, you can get that from any bookstore, whatever your favorite bookstore might be. Yeah. You can get it from them. Just walk in and say, I'm looking for The Art of Falling in Love by Joe Beam. And it's uh, published by Howard. 
which is a division of uh, Simon & Schuster. So any bookstore can get this for you, or you can Barnes & Noble. I mean, it's all over the internet. As a matter of fact, just the other day, Amazon bought a ton of them and was selling them at an amazingly low price for a few days because they had bought so many at one time. Kind of a good deal there right now. I mean, it may not be today, but a few days ago it was. As a matter of fact, an outstanding deal the other day. So in this, when we talk about the attraction, when we talk about that first part, there's four types of attraction, which most people don't even realize. Mm -hmm. When we think attraction, we think, well, it's how I look. It's, um, you know, if I want to be more attractive, I need to eat right. I need to work out. I need to dress well. Those are the things we think of. And all of those are true, but it's actually all under one part of the four parts of attraction. And in that part, it's what we call physical attraction. Right. Uh, several years ago, what I did was I went through thousands and thousands and thousands of pages about what attracts one individual to another. I mean, reading everything you can imagine from um, whether a face is symmetrical or not, believe it or not, that makes people more attractive. And so I read about breast size. I read about the way people communicate with each other. I read about histories. I mean, I read about everything you can imagine trying to think there's just so much information about what attracts one person to another that it somehow needs to be synthesized, brought down where it's understandable. And so finally, one day I figured out how to do that. And it's actually pretty simple once you get it. We call it PIES, P-I-E-S. Now, we're, we'll, we'll talk more about this in a minute, but physical attraction basically means that, that a person appears in a, in a way physically that you see that you're attracted to, or it can be what you hear. It can even be the tone of their voice. It can even be what you smell if they're wearing certain kinds of perfumes or colognes, but a physical attraction. People are drawn to that and people get that they understand, which is what Kimberly was saying about even the way you dress. But beyond physical attraction, there's a thing called intellectual attraction. And basically what that means is that you and the other person can actually communicate with each other. You can actually understand each other. It's not just the fact that a person has a body that attracts you or a face that attracts you. They actually have a mind that attracts you because you guys can understand and communicate to some degree. And then the thing called emotional attraction, which has to do with if you evoke emotions within another person that he or she enjoys feelings, they find you attractive. If you evoke emotions within another person that he or she does not enjoy feeling, you become unattractive. You've heard about people having charisma, for example. People with charisma are actually people that know how to do things to evoke emotions within you that you enjoy feeling. And that's what we call charisma. And then finally, there's a spiritual attraction, not necessarily in the sense of religion, but in the sense of who you are. In other words, what you believe, what you stand for, what motivates you. We often refer to it as beliefs and values. And so it's P, physical, I, intellectual, E, emotional, S, spiritual. And we copyrighted that some time ago because it just was a way to explain thousands and thousands of pages of research about what attracts one person to another, right? Absolutely. Hmm. We call it the pies. And in this pies, people have caught on to it. People are always working on their pies. Mm -hmm. It's something that if you're a follower of Marriage Helper, you know what the pies are. Mm -hmm. So the question that we got in has to do with that. And this person says, I know that the E or the emotional in the pies is the most important in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Managing my emotions has always been a struggle for me. Mm -hmm. Can you please give me some practical steps to improve my emotional attractiveness? Okay. Now, when the person says, I've found it difficult to manage or control my own emotions, that's not too unusual, particularly in a hectic world like we live in right now. And sometimes life just seems overwhelming. But emotional attraction definitely is based in your being able to control your emotions, no doubt about that. But if you want to think about how do I use it to attract another person, now, in this example, I'm assuming we're talking about somebody whose marriage is in trouble, is that right, or not? We can assume and that if it's... that's not the case, that's fine. We don't need to assume it if that's not the case. This is all they gave me? Okay. <laughs> all right. If you want to think in terms of what are the practical examples? Well, we could probably give you a thousand, but it would be better if you were asking me about each one. What, like in this situation, how does it work? That situation, how does it work? Think about it this way. Before you say anything to the other person, just stop for a second and think, which emotion is this likely to evoke within that person? If I say what I'm about to say, with the words I'm about to use, with the tone of voice I'm about to use, with the facial expression I'm about to use, with the volume I'm about to use, 
What is the likely reaction emotionally from this other person? Are they going to feel something that they enjoy feeling? Or are they going to feel something they do not enjoy feeling? Because how I say it, the words I use, all those things I just mentioned, if it's evoking a negative reaction within them, in other words, emotions they don't enjoy feeling, you've just pushed them further away. On the other hand, if it evokes, evokes emotions that they enjoy feeling, then it actually draws them closer to you. So let me give you just one example with that rather than trying for the thousands. Let's suppose you're upset with something that, uh, well, let's say it's a married couple. And let's say that she is unhappy with something he did. Let's say she found out that he spent a uh, hmm, couple of thousand dollars on a new set of golf clubs, and she's not happy about that because things are a little tight financially and they didn't talk about it ahead of time. Now, she can go straight at him. How dare you spend that money? You know that we're in trouble financially. You know that things are not good. You were just thinking about you. She has every right to say that if she wishes, because she's probably feeling that. But what kind of emotion do you think that's going to evoke within him? Well, it's going to evoke defensiveness, which is not a pleasant emotion. In other words, he's not going to feel all warm and cuddly. <laughs> he's not going to feel like, man, we have a really good relationship going on here. What he's going to feel is attacked. And therefore, he's going to defend himself and he may pop right back at you. You say, well, he may just feel penitent and tell me he's sorry and take the clubs back. He may. But because you came at him in such a way, as the words you said, the tone of voice, etc., are more likely to evoke a negative emotion, it's not likely his response is going to be, I'm so sorry, I'll take them back. You say, well, then how would I do it? Okay. You look at him and say, I see that you spent a couple of thousand dollars on the golf clubs. And I know that golf's really important to you. And I understand that you're thinking maybe even about your health, having some time to spend with the other guys. You know, I get that. But may I tell you how I feel? I feel that maybe that was more important to you than I am because I've been kind of stressed about our financial situation. And I know that you love me. And I know that you care about us. And I know you wouldn't want to put me in a situation like that. So maybe I've not been communicating well with you and that's why you did it without talking to me first. And so if that's the case, I'm sorry. I want it to always be safe where we can talk about things. But do you understand? I just want you to understand how I feel that you bought those clubs. You understand then you just had a totally different approach. You didn't attack him where he becomes defensive. Hopefully you're evoking a positive emotion. How? Because you're, first of all, being on his side. You're not attacking him. Secondly, you're trusting him with your emotions. You're letting him know how you feel. Thirdly, the tone of voice, the, the calmness, the all the things that you just did say to him, this is about us. I really do love you. I am hurt, but we can fix this. And that's more likely to evoke emotions within him, like I was just talking about, that are positive, including, I really do love you. I'm so sorry that I made you feel bad. I, I think I want to fix this because what I'm feeling now is a deeper love for you. You're really understanding me. We're really communicating. And that's the positive emotion. Even if he feels guilty and fixes it, which is negative, but it's a good negative. The positive is she really understands me and she's not attacking me. She's listening. Now, Kimberly, that's just one of the gazillion examples we mm -hmm. could give. But the bottom line still comes down to this. Before you do it, before you do the thing you're about to do or say the thing you're about to say, just think to yourself, what is the likely emotion that's going to evoke in the other person? Mm -hmm. Just ask yourself that question. So I'm going to snoop in his phone to see where he's been. If he discovers that, what's likely going to be the emotion? Now, you have a right to do whatever you want to do. But if you're thinking about how to become emotionally attractive, it's always stopping to think, how is this going to affect the other person? Now, remember what I said earlier about charisma? Mm -hmm, I do. Charisma is evoking positive emotions within other people. And the people that have it, are always making you feel good. Everything, that, the way they look at you, the way they smile at you, the way they listen to you, if they shake your hand, the way they shake your hand, that's what makes them charismatic. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that, wow, the things you're doing or saying are evoking positive emotions within me, emotions within me. Some people do that by instinct. Most of us have to learn how to do that. So but it can be learned. Absolutely, it can be learned. So this is not one of those things where someone could say, well, that's just not how I am. I'm not built that way. I'm not wired that way. I'm not an extroverted person. Yeah. This isn't that. No, they can say that if they wish. But it's wrong. But they're still going to have the negative <laughs> results from the other person. Right. I mean, you can justify anything if you wish. Well, that's just me. Mm -hmm. A guy told me one time, he said, I'm, I've just got a quick temper. That's just who I am. That's the way I'll always be. And I said, May I tell you another thing you're always going to be? He said, what's that? And I said, alone. 
mm. because your temper is so bad, everybody avoids you. So you can be whatever you want to be. But if you're thinking, how do I become emotionally attracted to the other person? Then it's not based on your personality. It's based on what you say, what you do, how you act. That's mm. where it's based. It takes a lot of forward thinking, being very intentional before you mm -hmm. speak, before you act. It, just pause two or three seconds and then think and then do. And it makes a huge difference, not just in your marriage, but this could work with children. It works with everybody. Yeah. The most charismatic people I ever met were like that. Um, one of the charismatic people I met, for example, was um, uh, Paul Bear Bryant, who was the coach at the University of Alabama. I talked to him maybe a minute, but in that minute, it was so cool because everything he did was designed to evoke positive emotions within me, and I was nobody. <laughs> he didn't know me. He didn't know anything about me. But in that minute conversation, he did that. Yes, yeah, so it's a learned thing. You can do that. Mm. And I imagine if you're going to be a football coach, you better learn how to do that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we have some live questions that have come in. One person has said, how do you strengthen and develop in the area of being able to articulate and connect emotionally with your spouse? Now, they had asked a question a little bit before that, which said, well, what about in a marriage that's in trouble where your spouse is weak in being able to articulate what their emotions are? The real key here is not about what your spouse is communicating. It's about what you're communicating mm, that's good. because people tend to reciprocate. Mm -hmm. If, if he or she is not very good at explaining what he or she feels is what's what I just read, right? Weak. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then rather than going, learn how to do this, <laughs> that's not going to help. You actually model it. Now don't overwhelm the other person. Don't say, now look, I'm going to teach you how to do this. Just listen to me. <laughs> That's not going to work either because think about it. What emotions that likely to evoke within him or her? Basically, you just put them down. But you can model it by you being open and transparent, you explaining what you feel. Don't do it in long bursts. I mean, spending five minutes to explain how you feel is probably not as powerful as spending a minute and a half to two minutes to explain how you feel because the other person can maintain attention and cue in and listen and understand. And so don't focus on how do I get him or her to be better at this? Mm -mm. You do it. And not trying to talk them into it. If that's what you're asking, I suggest don't do that. <laughs> don't try to talk them into it. You model it by being open and transparent to him or her, but not in a way that's overwhelming. And if you're thinking, how will I know if it's overwhelming? What's the reactions? When their eyes start glazing over or they start looking other places or you can tell them when they get out of the room, you're overdoing it. It's just a step at a time. Remember, this is, well, I was the old phrase, Kimberly, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Not a sprint. You don't have to do all of this in just one day, mm -hmm. or especially in one conversation. Take your time. This is something that happens over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's really good. Let's, I want to move on to another question that we've gotten. Okay. This next question, the person says, what can I do if my husband of 20 years feels that any request I have regarding my feelings on how I felt because of his action is taking as that I am not accepting him as he is, that I'm trying to change him by giving him a way of how to do something he did differently. I'm now to the point of thinking I have lived with this for 20 years and I no longer want this kind of relationship. I'm finding myself drifting and he can't see that. I don't bug him about issues, but when I do speak up, he says he can't worry about how I feel about his actions. If he can't even see what he is doing and thinks he doesn't need to change his thought process, how are things ever going to be different? He says he won't go to a workshop because he feels that everyone is going to want to change him. Honestly, he may have already lost me. We have gone around and around the past seven years trying to fix us, and he refuses to do any work on his part. Okay. When we start trying to understand a question like that, you see, here I am finding myself analyzing it without enough information. Uh, hopefully, and if we can make this work, our, our tremendous engineer and videographer, Jesse True, is working on some things here. And if he can make the technology work, we'll get to the point where he can actually take live callers. And then I can ask you questions to understand what you mean. But right now we can't do that. So let me break it down. When I hear a question like that, I'm thinking, okay, where is the breakdown? Is it that he is just a guy that's determined to be whoever he is, whatever it is, and he doesn't care what anybody else thinks? If he's that kind of guy, okay, that tells me one thing. Or could it be that the way you're communicating to him how you feel 
and you've been doing this for a while, you indicate over a period of years, that the way you're communicating to him how you feel is being heard by him in a way where it's like, I can't do anything right. You're never going to accept me as I am. And so finally I have given up. Now, there's even a third way, which is that the way you're communicating it has been so negative, and I'm not saying it's the case, I'm just trying to look at the analyzation here of what possibly is going on here, that, that he hasn't even considered the possibility of him changing because of the fact that he feels that it's been, if you'll forgive the word, nagging. Now, I don't know which of those it is, obviously. We can't tell that from this question. And if we ever do get, and we hope we will, to the live callers, I can ask you questions to help figure that out. But let's go through those three scenarios right now very quickly. Number one, if he's saying, I who I, I'm who I am, I'll be who I am, I don't care what you think, I don't care what you feel, then there's no magic bullet that's going to change him. If you have been compassionate and when, when you share, here's how I feel, and if you're communicating it in a way where that it truly is coming across as you talking about what you feel, as opposed to sounding like an attack on him. Because sometimes if we think we're actually talking about it from my standpoint, this is what I feel, the way we say it still comes across as an attack, even though we don't realize it. Like, this is what I feel when you do that thing you do. <laughs> I'm overemphasized that, obviously. But if you do that, it's still the other person's defensive. So we would look and say, okay, we'd love to hear some of the conversations about how you tell him that, because it may be self-revealing and say, oh, oh, we can give you this little tip here. Just change this, this way. Now, uh, Kimberly will tell, me more, tell you more about it in a minute, but you may want to get with one of our coaches who can coach you by phone to help you understand if you think that might be a problem. Okay, now, but if, if indeed he's the one that just says, I don't care what you think, I don't care what you feel, there is no magic bullet. If you're actually doing it the way you should, the way that gets the best results or the greatest likelihood of good results, then doing more of the same is probably not gonna change anything. Somewhere along the line, he has to realize what's happening and that he is going to lose you if that's the case. Okay, let's move to the next thing. Let's suppose that, it's a, that he feels he can't do anything right because he's regularly told, he's regularly told, I feel this when you do that. I feel this when you do that. I feel this when you do that. To the point where he's thinking, I can't do anything. I just can't do anything right. Even if you're saying it the right way, there's so many of them coming at him that somewhere along the line, his self-esteem gets shot and then he gets angry and then he gets rigid. Like, I'm not gonna let you tell me what to do. I'm not gonna worry about what you think about what I do. Now understand that's a completely separate scenario than the first one where he's just being obstinate. On this one, he is too being obstinate, but not for the same reason. That's not because of his arrogance, it's because of the fact that he's finally just given up because he feels he can't meet the criteria. Even if you're saying it in wonderful ways, but you're saying it so often, his self-esteem is destroyed. Then the third way, if you just continually nag to the point where he says, I don't care anymore. That's kind of a subdivision of the, or subsection, if you will, of the one I just talked about. So what do you do? Okay, I would recommend the following. Look for things that he does right, but not too many of them. You see, I'm, I'm guessing, and I'm just guessing, I don't know you, but I'm guessing that if you indeed have told him too many things, this is how I feel when you do this, when you do that, etc., then cutting back on your communication is actually an advantageous thing to do. And so I would ask that you th consider adding in some compliments. You know something? I really like the way you do this. But you can't build a bunch of those back to back because that feels like a setup, like, oh, what's coming next? Just occasionally, when he does something, just look at him and go, you know, I probably never tell you enough, but I really appreciate how you do that. Thank you. Boom, let it go. That's all you're going to say. Move on. And if you do that for a while and really cut back on telling him how you feel about what he does, then maybe, just maybe, you could get a chance of changing this communication pattern. Now, again, if he's just totally selfish, arrogant, and obstinate, this might not help. But if indeed it's because maybe you're communicating too much, this actually could help. And certainly whatever you do, don't nag. Oh, and Kim Kimberly, uh, can you take just 60 seconds and tell them about coaches? Because I think this is the situation mm -hmm. where people sometimes can really benefit from having that conversation with the coach saying, here's what I said, here's what he said, and the coach can help them think it through. For sure. 
One of the things that we talk about, one of the things that we do is that we are, um, we teach 80%. We teach some foundational principles that can work in many different situations. But then there's this extra 20% at the end that's really situa situationally specific to you and your circumstance and what you are going through, whether it's personally or something that is going on in your marriage. And so that is why we have the coaching that we offer here at Marriage Helper. We have had amazing success with the people who have come through our coaching program where they have said, this has made all of the difference. I understood the concepts, but I didn't understand how to apply them in my marriage. And so we have coaching available for you as a solo spouse. If it's not a situation where your husband or your wife is wanting to do coaching with you or they can't because they're gone or you're divorcing or whatever that looks like, then our coaches will work with you as an individual and they'll teach you how you can apply these things no matter what your spouse is doing or not doing, there are things you can do and steps you can take in order to fix your marriage. And that's huge. The other part of it is if, if you and your spouse are stuck and you're saying, we've gone to counselors, we've gone to pastors, we've gone to friends, and everything has been not helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People have told us this can't work. They've given us bad advice, whatever it is. Our coaches also work with marriages like that over the phone, over Skype, FaceTime from anywhere in the world. They have clients from Dubai to Australia to London to all of the 50 states. And so we are, I, it might sound like I'm bragging, but we're really good at working with marriages <laughs> yeah. and our coaches are fan. Fantastic. And so if you want more information about our coaching, you can give us a call. You can go online and find out more at marriagehelper.com or call us. Toll free is 866-903-0990. And we're real people who are going to answer the phone. You're not going to find an automated recording. You're going to find real people who can answer the phone and get you the information and the results, whatever you might be looking for we're going to be here for you in that. So I definitely encourage people to look into our coaching. Could you do that number a little slower? Even I know that number and I missed it. It was so fast. <laughs> I can't. So it's 866-903-0990. And if you, get, if, if you go to us at marriagehelper.com, you can see the number there to call as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. In case you, in case you didn't get a hold of that. All right. Well, I would love to cut to a video that we have and this video is super special so it actually follows couples that go through our workshop you've heard us talk about our workshop in previous episodes in this episode as well the workshop that we do here in nashville tennessee people come from all over the world to this marriage workshop because it has an amazing mm -hmm. success rate of saving 77 percent of marriages that attend which is astounding and one of the things that we have had the, the blessing of being able to have is last fall, we followed some of these couples from day one to day three. And so there's a quick short video that we have, but it shows some of the things that happen at the workshop, which can be hard to believe unless you see it for yourself. Mm. So let's take a look. We'll see you in just a couple minutes. I guess the only thing that really scares me is that we go through this week and, and, you know, we go back home and she decides that, you know, she doesn't want to continue. I hope that my mind has changed and I want to stay married, I guess. In all due honesty, I have no hope and no expectation because I just don't want to be disappointed anymore. But um, I'm to a point where I don't want to try anymore. What scares me is just thinking that he's, I guess he's not going to want to stay together that he'll realize that um, maybe I'm not the right one for him. Marriage helpers for anyone who is married. We don't just save marriages. We help people to learn how to communicate, how to listen, how to understand, how to love your spouse, and we help you learn to fall in love with your spouse all over again. We're more than just a website with tons of free resources, articles, testimonials, and podcasts to help you more deeply understand yourself and your spouse and to know why you make the choices you do. We are people who truly care just a phone call away, who will speak with you, counsel you, and help you and your spouse live a happier, healthier life together. On top of the free resources, we also offer courses and a three-day weekend seminar that have helped hundreds of people with their marriages. 
And since 2009, we have been able to save 75% of the marriages that enter into our programs. We are here to help because Marriage Helper believes in marriage, and we believe in helping people to live the happiest, healthiest life that they can live. I knew we were going to talk about kind of the final stage, you know, but I was kind of expecting it to be this um, euphoric, like something unattainable that, you know, the couple people have, have this thing or, but what it really just sounded like was just really enjoying life together. Um, I definitely want us in one form or another to be somewhere different than we are now, better, in a better place than we are now mm -hmm. together as a, as, as, as a couple. And I'm hoping for a new marriage with the same guy. Just everything. There's three days of so much information, so much good stuff. I left here yesterday very much like, you know, mad at the situation and I just don't think that was right. But then coming back today and finishing up, I, I'm really glad that we did come and that we've done it. And obviously we have work to do or we wouldn't be here, but it was very insightful and it's really great information. I mean, for anybody, that would want to come, I, th I think it's definitely worth it to come because it, it, it's going to help a lot. I love that video. I love seeing the change that comes when people come through our workshop. And we actually have a testimony of someone that had come through our workshop that they submitted it to be shared and we are excited about sharing it with you. Dan and Tara said, I was about to file for legal separation from my husband. It had been the second bout of his pornography addiction in the span of our marriage and I was done. I hated him for it. I was bitter and cynical after I found out and I wouldn't give him any more chances. I was set on I was set on that. I was set on ending the marriage. I made him move out and I only talked business with him and the kids. I made him feel worthless, unfortunately, and I achieved that. He was at rock bottom and beyond despair. He begged me to go to this marriage helper workshop with him. And it was actually the second time that we ended up going to the workshop. But he would not allow his heart to open up the first time. And so he told me that he had felt like such a jerk for acting prideful and self-righteous the first time and that he felt we needed to go back. I reluctantly agreed after much prodding from my family and from his family not giving up. I didn't want to sit by him. I was known as the most angry one there and after the first day I felt my heart melting and my wall coming down which I thought would never happen. I didn't want it to happen but I saw his heart change and I felt my heart change. I felt us becoming whole as individuals again, because how can you have a marriage if you yourselves are not whole and never have been? Marriage Helper saved our marriage and helped us realize we needed to find healing within ourselves and then our relationship and see why we've come to the point where we were. It was such a powerful weekend for us that we no longer celebrate our actual wedding anniversary. We celebrate the day we renewed our wedding vows after the Marriage Helper oh, wow. weekend. That's, I love it. Wow. Without Marriage Helper, we would never be together today. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts and our children, thank you as well. I always get emotional every time. Hey, it's, in our business, when we stop being emotional, it's time for us to go do something else. Yeah. Because what we do, we do because we care about people. Yeah. I mean, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We, we're not trying to put millions of dollars in the bank. We, we just want to break even. And, and uh, what drives us, mm -hmm. what drives us are, are those letters. Yeah, I, I love it. And we want to celebrate with Dan and Tara. So one of the things that we're gonna send them at Marriage Helper are some of our shirts. So they're gonna get the I Love My Wife shirt and they're gonna get the I Love My Husband shirt um, with mm. Marriage Helper on the back. And we'll send them some other goodies as well. But we wanna share your testimonies and we wanna celebrate with you when we get your testimonies. So that's. One of the things that we'll be doing this week, celebrating with Dan and Tara. I love it. I so love if it. I write a letter, can I get one of those shirts? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how good your letter how good is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we have a lot of live questions that have come in, so I'm going to go through some of these. And again, some of these questions are pretty vague. 
Uh, we would love to be able to ask the questions back to you, and hopefully we'll get to the point where we take live callers soon. But until then, we can answer to the extent that we know to answer. But if you feel like you need more, call us. Get into our coaching. Get registered for one of our workshops, mm -hmm. whatever that looks like for you. So Eric, he says, can Dr. Joe speak to how people change? Many people are slow to change, even if negative circumstances are in their marriage. What does it take to make true changes that last? Hmm. It's a much more complicated question than we can answer in a short period of time. So let me just give a brief answer and hope this gives enough. Typically, people, just like organizations, don't change unless the pain of staying like they are becomes overwhelming. What I mean is change always has some pain involved in it. I mean, if I change to become a different person, that requires some kind of effort on my part. So this, let me say that's pain. It's going to require something on my part to change. I've got to think things differently. I've got to feel things differently. I've got to do things differently. Something's got to change. And so we have a natural friction against that, a natural resistance against change, because it's just easier to keep doing things like we're doing them. So what then finally motivates people to change? It's like when I finally see that as being better than what I have here. Either the pain here, I can't live like this anymore. I can't do this anymore. And so even though it'll be involve some pain, if you'll let me use that word, some effort to change to become like this, it's worth it because the pain here is so great, I've got to do something to alleviate it. That's one of the reasons. Or it could be that the attractiveness of this over here, this new thing is so great that it's attractive enough that I'll do it. Now, if it's not attractive enough, it doesn't happen. How many people do you think have seen those exercise machines on television, selling for a thousand, two thousand, whatever, I don't know what they all sell for, and they look at that and go, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get that thing. I'm going to get in shape. And they buy it and they put it in their house. And now it requires effort on their part to do that, that change to become that other person, to get better shape in better shape physically. And after a while, most of those machines, I think, I don't have documentation, wind up being what you hang your clothes on and then finally go out to the garage and maybe finally to Goodwill. Why? Because it was not enough motivation. So I've got to see this as being better than that. Now that's when people change. I've got to see the changed way, the new way, as being so much better than what I have or am in now that either it alleviates my pain or it gives me something that I really, really want and therefore I'm willing to do that. So why does some change quicker than others? Well, then it's the way you do it. Some people tend to act rapidly. Other people tend to process everything slowly. So therefore, some change faster. Believe it or not, it's the ones that change more slowly that are more likely to stay with the change because they really process it. Now, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question exactly, but that's what the motivation is. And if you want somebody to change, either they personally have to see this way's not working for me. It's got too many problems. I can't live like this. Or they have to see that is so much better that I'll have enough motivation for that, that I'll pay the price to get there, whatever that is. And you can't do that to another person. That has mm -hmm. to come from within. Now you can help them understand the pain here and sometimes that'll help. You can help them understand the great things here and sometimes that will help. But eventually it has to happen inside of them. I want this instead of this. And if they want it badly enough, they will do it. But then be patient. and. If they do a little of this back and forth in the process, don't panic. Just be there for them to support them as they get back up toward the new way. Mm -hmm. In fact, if we try and change our spouse or if we try and push them quicker, faster, they'll end up resenting us. And may not do the change at all. And may not do the change at all. That's absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. Another question that we got in, and this is a great question because I've many years ago I thought the same thing. I had the same question. It says, most of the material I have read and suggestions that I see on how to save your marriage when an affair is happening are of people who have children. Could I get more information on how to proceed in situations where we haven't been married long, we don't have any kids that necessitate contact, and we don't even have an affair? How can we save the marriage? Okay. Every situation, of course, is absolutely unique. We understand that. When we talk about children, because if people do have children, they tend to have an emotional connection to those children. Notice I said tend to, some people don't. For example, here in America, if a divorce takes place and there are kids in the home, 
uh, about 25% of dads within a year of the divorce have little to nothing to do with their kids. That's why I say they tend to. And so when you hear us talking about kids, it's because of, that's kind of a leverage, if you will. It's, it's like, this is something that's important to you. And this is a motivation, a motivation for you to try to fix the marriage because of what you will be able to do that's positive for your kids, as opposed to the negative that's going to occur if you divorce each other. So that's why we talk about that a lot, because people really need to think about that. I mean, they really do need to think about that because so many kids suffer so much when adults don't think about them. Or when some misguided counselor says, oh, the kids will be fine, I'll help them, they'll be okay. The kids are gonna have pain if you divorce. All right, but that's not your case, so forgive me. It's just I get really upset when I think about that. You say, okay, we have nothing in common. We don't even have an affair to fight. We've only been married for a short period of time, which makes me wonder what happened. Mm -hmm. Remember the basic principle is this, people don't leave what they have unless they believe what they're going to is better. Say it again, people don't leave what they have unless they believe that what they're going to is better. Now, if, was this a woman or a man? I can't remember that asked the question. Seems, seems like it, it was a female. It does seem like a female. Okay, and so if indeed it's your husband and he doesn't want to be in the marriage anymore and he is leaving you, the question would become why? Okay, now it's either because I see something out here that's actually more attractive to me than you are, meaning, that I believe that is better than being with you. That can be a, something like a lifestyle. Hey, I got married, I'm missing that single lifestyle. I like going out and doing what I wanna do when I wanna do it with the people I wanna do it with. That could be anything from I like going out and getting drunk to I like going out and sleeping with different people to whatever. I just like going out to party, whatever it might be. So it might be that he is being attracted by something out there that you said the marriage is short-lived that therefore probably he discovered after he got married that, wow, I missed that a lot. And therefore he's headed back to it because he sees it better than being with you. Or the other could be, and don't hear this as an attack, I'm just trying to explain the principle, that, that living with you actually was painful for him. What I mean by that is that um, maybe you got spot all the time or maybe you were dominating or controlling or whatever. I don't mean you, I'm just talking about principle here. I'm not saying that you did anything wrong, I certainly don't know. But the question becomes, hmm, is he going to something out here that he sees as better? Is that because there's something other than me that he finds attractive in the sense that even if he finds me attractive, he finds that more attractive, like a lifestyle, whatever. Or is it that living with me is so miserable that he thinks being alone is better than being with me? Now it's gonna be one of those two situations, right? And you say, okay, so we don't have anything in common. We have no kids, we have no business together. How in the world can I communicate with him? And the response is, you can't. Now I know that sounds scary and it sounds bad, but stay with me here. It means that, that the contact points that other people would have, you don't have, and there's no magic thing here that makes him communicate with you. Now there are some people out there who say things like this, well just send him a text every day, send him a card every day, let him know that you're there, etc. We say that if he really doesn't want to be with you, whether he thinks it's bad to be with you or whether he likes this other thing better, that could backfire on you. Now if you want to try it, it's your business, give it a shot. Send him a text every day, send him a card every day if that's what you want to do. But if you do that, pay close attention to how he reacts. Because if he reacts in any negative way, like just leave me alone or why are you doing this? Stop it. I would suggest you listen to him because if you continue after he says something like that, then you're just gonna push him further and further away. So you say, okay, so what if I decide not to try that? What do I do? Is it hopeless? Is it done? Is it over? Now we always tell the truth to people even when it's truth we don't even like. And the truth is without those anchors, if you will, those ropes to help hold you together that some other couples have, it will be tougher. But we always tell the truth, and you, but you already know it's gonna to be tougher. So what do you do? You work on the pies. Now, if you're not familiar with pies, go to our website, marriagehelper.com. You can read all about the pies there. If you want to, get the book, The Art of Falling in Love, one of the books that I've written, The Art of Falling in Love by Dr. Joe Beam, and you can read about them there. You work on yourself physically, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. That's what the pies stand for, and the book or the website explains more. Physically, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually. And if you're thinking, but we have no contact with each other, so why? 
Well, first of all, you do it for you. It's the most important thing you can do for yourself right now. Secondly, if you have anyone in your world that's in common, anyone that's in common, what we hope will happen is that some of them notice you becoming better, a better human being physically, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually. Again, read the descriptors on our website. And hopefully that word gets back to him somewhere, somehow, some way. You can't make it happen if you try to set it up. It's probably going to backfire on you. Now, Kimberly, I took a long time to answer a short question, but I wanted to get as many principles out there mm -hmm. as I could. So what did you hear my final point to be? Let's see if I got me so confused that nobody heard what I said just no, then. So tell was, me the point. It was great. When your marriage is in a situation where you're unhappy or your spouse is unhappy and there's not a lot of what we at Marriage Help Helper call ropes, that are holding you together, it can feel like it's hopeless because there's no way to get the person to stay. But what Dr. Joe Beam, I don't know what to call you ever. Just, just <laughs> call me Joe, how about that? <laughs> what Joe was just saying is that the thing that you can do and what there's always hope in is starting by working on you, focusing on yourself physically, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually. And while sometimes that can seem like kind of a cop-out answer, well, oh, you're just telling me to do that because you don't know what I should do. Hmm. <laughs> That's not it at all. We're telling you to do that because it makes the most impact the quickest of anything that you can do. Most people just don't do it. Most people don't. Yeah. And, and you think, well, what if I do it and he doesn't come back? It's still the best thing you can do for yeah. you. And and it still will make your next relationship. Now we hope this one works. We, we are not trying to get people to separate or divorce, mm -hmm. but if it doesn't work, it'll still make you a better you to the point where the next relationship will be a much better relationship. Mm -hmm. But it's the thing. I mean, you don't have a lot of options right now. Right. This is the best option you have. Work on you and all of those areas. Oh, see, well, I just work on me. You don't need to explain pies. Well, the purpose of the pies is to help you to know what to work on. Right, exactly. And your situation may not be that your spouse has left and that you're trying to get him back and you don't have any of these leverage points of kids or an affair going on or things like that. Maybe your question is more so mm. asking, well, we're just not happy. What's going on? How can we figure out how to be happy? And is, is our marriage always going to be miserable like this? And the answer to that is no, it doesn't have to be at all. And still in the book, The Art of Falling in Love, Joe walks through that process of how to fall more in love, how people can get off course. And even starting back, both of you starting back at those pies, starting back at the beginning of the love path is going to make a huge difference. It could be that you have a situation similar to what my husband and I had, which was we have very strong personalities and very different personalities. So I'm very extroverted, he's very introverted. I'm um, very outgoing, more emotional. He's very logical, very methodical. And so when you take those two extremely different people, but both of us are incredibly stubborn. And yes, then you, yes you are. <laughs> we are. And then you put them together and you say, now figure out how to live together. It wasn't easy at all. And so we had to figure out how to do that. And it didn't take a month. It didn't take a year. It took a few years for us to get into that rhythm of figuring out how to communicate well, how to understand each other, how to uh, compromise in a way that we naturally didn't enter the marriage thinking. But one of the things that society tells us is when you marry someone with a very different personality than you, then it's called on the divorce papers, irreconcilable differences. You yeah. can't make it work. We couldn't figure it out. We just don't jive well together. So we need to find someone else who is a better fit for us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this can be done. how it goes. Now, the book will help mm -hmm. if you decide to get the book, uh, The Art of Falling in Love uh, by Joe Beam. Uh, but the book itself is not gonna be the thing that solves all your problems. Mm -hmm. The book is to help educate you but it still comes down to what you do. In other words, read the book, it's important, it's got all the principles, but it still comes back to what you do. And sometimes that's when you need somebody to help you. Uh, like, okay, I've read it, but I'm still having trouble implementing it in our particular situation. I need to ask somebody, mm -hmm. how do you do that in this situation? How do you do it in that situation? Well, if you get to that point and need that, we can help you with that as well. Mm -hmm. You call us and, and we have coaches that are available to you, not counselors or therapists but coaches who can actually coach you through how to do this if you need that help. 
Now, if you don't, fine, wonderful. We, we're happy for you to do it. But if you need our help, we've got people here who'll help you. Go to our website, marriagehelper.com, marriagehelper.com, and you can figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that when we get married, we don't get a lot of training for how to be a <laughs> husband or a wife. No. We get training on how to be doctors, lawyers, whatever you do in your profession. But parenting and marriage are two things that we aren't trained on. And so hmm. when couples who are in this kind of situation where they're newlyweds or they've been married for a shorter amount of time, there's not a terrible thing that's happened, but they know they need to have a better marriage. When those couples come to our workshop, they aren't in a crisis state. And so they're able to get a lot more information out of our workshop. Our workshop's very popular for people who are in a crisis situation because it's at that point they're willing to invest three days in their marriage. But how much more powerful would it be for your marriage if you invest that three days on the front end before something terrible happens that you're trying to crawl your way out of as quick as you can? But when you're in that state where you can hear everything that's being said, when you can take it all in much better. That's when my husband and I went. We went a month after we got married and it was, we say that the workshop saved our marriage, not the month that we went, but four years later. <laughs> we were able to yeah. use that information and implement it. And it was worth the three-day investment and the financial investment. I mean, the whole thing, you can't put that kind of price tag on it. It's right. It's absolutely amazing. So I would encourage that coaching or the workshop. Joe, we have one final question okay. that we're going to cover. And again, it's one of those can be a bit vague, but the okay. question is, how can you trust again after an affair has happened? Trust is something that is developed. It doesn't just automatically happen. I guess it does automatically happen if you're a baby in arms. You trust the person is holding you not to, not to let you fall. But then notice that as soon as that baby attaches to mom and dad, then he or she doesn't automatically trust other people. You hand that baby to somebody else and often they panic. Trust is developed. Now, when trust has been violated, it has to be redeveloped. You say, well, what makes trust happen? What, how do you develop it? What do you do? Trust is the belief that you're not going to hurt me. That's basically what it is. Not only that you will not hurt me, but that you will be there for me that you will actually be there when I need you to be. You're not going to abandon me. You're not going to do something to hurt me in any shape, fashion, or form. That's when I trust you. It's when I believe those things. Okay, so it asks you about an affair. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So an affair obviously hurt you. That means that trust has been violated. Can it be rebuilt? Yes. The first thing that has to happen, in my estimation, if you're really going to rebuild trust, is to tell the other person genuinely and honestly that you're sorry that you hurt him or her. I am truly sorry that I did that. And, and if it fits within your belief system, because it defi definitely does in mine, not only am I so sorry I hurt you, I'm asking if you can find it in your heart, would you please forgive me? Because there needs to be a, a formal acknowledgement of what you did. If you don't acknowledge what you did, it's very difficult to trust you again, because it's like, not only did you hurt me, you won't even admit that you hurt me. And if you won't admit that you hurt me, how can I trust you? Because I think you're, well, I know you're lying because you did hurt me. So you admit what you did. You don't have to beat yourself up. You don't have to crawl on broken glass, but you do need to look the person in the eye and say, I did it. And I'm sorry I did it. And I'm sorry I hurt you. And they ask, will you forgive me? Which is also part of the process because if the other person, the one who's been hurt, doesn't grant that forgiveness, then the one who hopes to re redevelop trust doesn't know whether it's gonna work or not. It's like, no matter how hard I try at this, if you won't forgive me, if you're never gonna get past it, They'll try for a while, but if they still feel that you look down on them or you're still angry with them or you're still distant from them, they'll try hard for a while, but at some point it'll be like, I give up. I, I, can't, I can't break through that barrier of yours. And so the person that's done the thing, admit it, ask for forgiveness. The person that's been hurt, if you really want to redevelop trust, you grant the forgiveness. You say, but I don't know if he'll hurt me or she'll hurt me again in the future. That's right. You're not forgiving the future. You're forgiving the past. I forgive you for what you did. Then you set about some boundaries and criteria where that each of you can feel safe, particularly the person that was hurt. And so if, you, if your wife had an affair, for example, 
and now she's trying to put the marriage back together and she needs to rebuild the trust of the husband, it will be, tell you what I'm going to do for the next 12 months. Anytime you want to pick up my cell phone and see any of my text messages, you can. I won't delete any of them. They'll all be there and you can look at them. Or maybe even if, if she offers this, uh, I'll turn the GPS on on my cell phone so you can always see where I am. In other words, you do two or three things, not 30. Please understand me. If you do too much of this, the other person won't feel trusted anyway. They'll feel like you put them under your thumb and they're in jail. But two or three things that, that you do so the other person can begin to develop the trust again because it's like, I feel safe if I can look at your cell phone. I feel safe if I know where you are. Sometimes we see it this way. Um, maybe she had the affair with a guy at work and the husband says, I just won't feel safe if you go back to work. And so she says, okay, I'll resign that position. I'll find another. You might be saying, wow, isn't that pretty drastic? <laughs> yeah, it is, but so is an affair. And we say, you do whatever it takes so the other person can see that you will help them be safe. And maybe for up to a year, live under glass where you, everything is seen for a while. You can't live like that forever, but for long enough, for long enough that the other person can start seeing, okay, you really are living up to your word. I can trust you. And one final part, open and honest conversation with each other, not only about what you do, which is really important, but about what you feel because those open and honest conversations develop trust as faster, faster than anything, because I know what's really happening inside your head and inside your heart. Mm. That's good. We had a lot of questions come in that we couldn't get to today, but here's what I want to encourage you to do. First of all, if you're wondering, hey, you've talked a lot about coaching workshops, you say you're real people. <laughs> if you have questions and you're wondering if your situation would be a good fit, for how we do things and what we offer here at Marriage Helper, then please do give us a call. Yes, We do have a whole team of people, our client relations team, who will speak with you, who will listen to your situation, who will give you some free resources that we have, whether it's an article, a podcast, an ebook, whatever that might fit your situation. And they'll also tell you how coaching or the workshop, if those are things you're interested in, could be able to help. So don't feel like you have to wait until next Monday at noon to ask that question again. You can also talk to our team. They have been well-trained. They're not gonna have the extensive amount of knowledge that Dr. Joe has, of course, but they're really good and they'll be able to help you out with that. We would love for you to subscribe so that you can see all of the videos that we add throughout the week so that you can get the reminders next week when we're going live again and to, to follow us on YouTube, to go to our podcast, subscribe to that, to go to marriagehelper.com and look through our articles. We offer a ton of resources for you because we want to help you. Our mission at Marriage Helper is to save marriages and to strengthen families. And if I may ask a favor, tell your friends. Yeah. to subscribe to this so that we can talk Absolutely. to that many more people every Monday when we do this live, as well as the Absolutely. other things we put on YouTube. Uh, you can help us spread the word. If you think what we're doing and what we're talking about is helpful, post it on your Facebook page, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm, go subscribe to this thing free. I recommend it. In other words, you recommend it, not me, you. Uh, do it on your Facebook page. Tell the people at your church if you go to church, people at work. Help us spread the word because we really do want to help a lot of people. And you, you can make that happen if you will. And we're Absolutely. asking, we're asking if you will, would you please do that? Absolutely. And we want to hear your questions. You can send them to live at marriagehelper.com. That's L-I-V-E at marriagehelper.com. And we'll be able to select the ones that we're going to use for the next week's program. And if you have a testimony where your marriage has been saved or made better or something awesome has happened in your life because of the workshop, because of the show that we do, whatever it might be, we want to celebrate that with you and you'll get some free stuff too. So <laughs> we look forward to that. I might be more excited about the shirts than the people <laughs> who get them, but yeah. that's okay. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you, Dr. Joe. We're going to see you, you again next week. Have a great week. We're here for you however you need us, and we'll see you next Monday.